Hi everyone, thanks for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff and I'll be your host for the show. Before we get started, if you've had a Dogman Encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. Like a lot of you who are listening to the show, I've been fascinated by this whole missing 411 topic for quite some time now. We're going to break from tradition and instead of having an actual dogman eyewitness come on tonight's show, I've invited a gentleman named Christopher who's elected to keep his last name anonymous so that he can come on and talk about some of these cases he's investigated and reveal how they might have ties to dogmen. Christopher, welcome to the show. Hi Vic, thanks for having me. Oh, thanks so much for being here. Christopher, please give us a brief bio on yourself. I know a lot of people like to say that I'm such and such, and you should listen to me for these reasons. I'd really like people to listen to what I have to present just on its own merit. I like to describe myself as a nobody and a nothing, which isn't quite true. In the past, I worked for the government in a position I'd rather not get into at this point, because I don't think it's relevant. And I don't know that anything in my background particularly gives me the expertise to say, oh, I know animals because of this, that, and the other. When I like to think of myself as a concerned citizen, someone that saw a pattern and decided to look into it the way essentially any good American could. Right now, I'm living in the Midwest. My spouse is retired military, and that's how I found myself out here, which gave me a certain amount of free time on my hands to dig into a few things. What caused your interest in dogmen in the first place? I was actually living in Milwaukee around the time that Linda Godfrey was first reporting on some of the interesting dogman cases. So my then-girlfriend and I actually took the time to drive out to some of the areas that were mentioned in the Beast of Bray Road books. I never actually saw anything. It certainly seemed a little spooky out there, especially at night. But it was around that same time also that what spurred me to think there might be something to some of this was that a series of mystery kangaroos were turning up, both when I was there in Milwaukee and after I left. These were actual kangaroos. People caught and trapped some of them, including one alive. And to my knowledge, no one ever figured out where the kangaroos came from. So I thought to myself, well, you know, if there's kangaroos that are a known animal that are turning up where they're very much not supposed to be, and no one seems to know why or trade credit for it, what else might be out here in these Wisconsin woods? And I suppose that was the genesis of it, perhaps over a decade ago, when I was actually on the scene where some of the folklore of this had evolved. And originally I'm from Michigan, which was home to, the, of course, the Michigan Dogman stories. So I'd heard a few stories growing up that, as a child, made me think, primed me to think that there could be things out there that people just see and don't necessarily report or keep to themselves or that don't get a lot of publicity. If you have a Sasquatch encounter and report it, you expect to be laughed at, but I guess not nearly as much so as if you come forward and try to report a dogman encounter, so that really is no surprise. I think that to a certain extent people do report dogman encounters more than many people have realized and that there's even official investigations at times, but I don't think anyone knows how to place it. I think it's an example of something I heard in the TV show House once, where he advised one of his students that if they hear hooves, to think of horses and not zebras. But, of course, sometimes there are zebras. I think what sometimes people have happened is that they don't know how to form it in their own mind and aren't quite sure what they saw, so they try and put it in the most familiar terms possible, and end up reporting wolves or large dogs or strange dogs or give an indication of something being out of the ordinary, but in general, put it as a dog. And looking at that, that we also will find that there's been more reports than many people realize where fatalities get attributed to dogs. I like the way you put that. You've got a lot of really good points there. How many of the murder cases we're about to talk about tonight do you think actually were caused by dog men? Well, as I was reading on the subject matter and starting to dig into it, what struck me is that I believed I was only scratching the surface of what's been taking place. There's some indication that dog attacks in general get underreported in the United States for political reasons 
the CDC wasn't necessarily doing a great deal of work to analyze animal attacks, especially of domestic dogs. And I believe local media reports often lack a follow-up investigation. So the cases that I'd focused on in my initial research are ones that struck me as being unusual or outside of the ordinary. Certainly people do get attacked by domestic dogs. It happens. There's no denying that. But I tried to focus on cases where it seemed that there was something strange going on and it seemed to fit a pattern that began to emerge. And what I came up with was mostly in the last 10 years, because I was relying on Internet research, of about 100 cases of individuals that I believe may have been a fatality related to something related to an unknown canine or a disappearance related to an unknown canine, and then around another 15 or so historical cases that I happened to find the information on that seemed fairly well documented that seemed to fit the same pattern. So you're talking with just an initial research of about 115 cases that I had serious questions about. Not too long ago, an animal attack occurred on the Wind River Indian Reservation. Let's start off talking about that case. Yes, the Wind River case is actually the one that got me started down this path. It was the proverbial rabbit hole that I started journeying down. I said I'm in the Midwest. I'm actually in the state of Wyoming. So one of the first things I happened to do is I had been reading the latest Missing 411 book, and around the same time I'd finished reading one of, rereading actually, one of Linda Godfrey's books about Dogman. And I was familiar with the general concept of people going missing under strange circumstances, strange disappearances, as well as reports of unknown animals. So I simply started with a Google search. I typed in something like mysterious animal attacks or strange animal attacks in Wyoming, my home state. And that's what immediately brought me to the case of Deanne Lynn Colando Tivonis. News reports sometimes just call her Deanne Lynn Colando. She was a 40-year-old Native American woman, a part of the East Shoshone tribe, who was found dead in late 2014 on a large Indian reservation here in Wyoming. It's uh, the Wind River Indian Reservation. What struck me about this case was that the initial information on it that played out even through the local newspapers sounded like the openings of a horror film. The coroner actually went to the unusual step of issuing a warning for the entire area, telling people essentially, be on the lookout, there's an unknown predator, consider keeping your children inside, and report any unknown or dangerous-looking animal, either domestic or wild. Please report that there's a public health threat. And I actually called the coroner there, and and I'll leave his name out of it because I haven't, haven't signed an interview form or something, but he basically expressed that he did that, because he thought that there was a threat to the public health and safety, and he wanted to go public with a warning in order that people in the area would know that something was going on. So essentially what happened is this unfortunate woman, she was found unconscious outside, and the initial report was that it was a dog attack. But when you dig into it, and I, I do thank the reporters for the local paper because they had not a lot going on, in terms of unusual crime cases, so they did actually do some digging that they reported in the paper. So when the woman was found unconscious with a faint pulse, the radio traffic of the first responders was actually overheard and made public. And what was happening was this woman was found badly torn up. There was a very faint pulse, so she was still alive when she was found. And initially they were unsure, oh, what do we got going on here? We have someone that's pretty much torn up. Sharks don't walk on land. What, what's happened here? Was this a crime? And they weren't sure, so they were treating it as a criminal investigation. There were unusual footprints of some type found on the scene, and I can't find out any more information as to what made them unusual. But I know that the scene where she was found was secured by the first responders because of a trail of footprints that they wanted to follow up on, and that no one heard anything. This was in an area that wasn't entirely remote. It was on the Indian Reservation, but there were buildings and a school and such nearby, but we had no witnesses. We had nothing confirmed that anyone heard screams. This woman was found around November 13th of 2014, so it was a fairly recent case, still fresh in everyone's memory. By five days later, the story was already in the paper that it was a pack of dogs that was responsible. However, it turns out that the autopsy results 
weren't even back in yet at the time that that was a story that was released. I was also able to find out just by poking around a little bit that a number of federal agencies were involved in this case right from the beginning. The Federal Bureau of Investigation normally does investigate crimes on Indian reservations, not necessarily accidents. And I was later able to get the coroner's docket report for this case, and it labeled it an accident. And yet, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Department of Indian Affairs, and the Federal Fish and Wildlife folks were all over this area right after it happened. And there were reports of unusual black vehicles. We actually had the men in black out here looking into this, in that there were federal agents who weren't necessarily identifying what agency they were with, who were driving black SUVs, who within a day of this woman being found dead were parked in the area and were known to be questioning people. The local authorities were also told that the FBI was taking DNA samples, and yet nothing was ever followed up on that. And indeed, the coroner report that lists this woman's death says, actually I have it right in front of me, it says that the cause of death was an accident due to exsanguination consistent with dog bites. So it doesn't say that it was dog bites. It says it was consistent with dog bites, which I thought was interesting. I also found it interesting that although this was called an accident, that you still had a lot of federal involvement in the case. Like you would think for an accident, like someone falling off the roof or being hit by a car. It also seems strange that although there have been issues reported with a fair number of stray dogs on this reservation, They've never actually attacked anyone before. And indeed, the attorney general of the tribe, when contacted regarding the matter, had never heard of a real problem with dogs on the reservation. That they were there, but that no one had been attacked by them, no one had talked to her about it, she didn't know about it. And there was an allusion to dogs being killed on the reservation occasionally when they became a problem but that no one knew anything about a roaming pack of dogs or had any reason to suspect that there would be a threat to people. And what was to be important later as I began to figure out a pattern to this was that the deceased was actually apparently intoxicated at the time she was set upon. She had a relatively high blood alcohol content. However, I'm not a forensics expert, and I've heard different things regarding post-mortem blood alcohol content can be elevated because of the decomposition of the body, depending on to when it was tested for. But I do believe that the woman was intoxicated when she was set upon. She appears to have been 40 years old and was otherwise in good health. So I think that being intoxicated was what identified her as a weakness to whatever ended up attacking her. Animal control in the area never did respond to an inquiry that I placed with them as to whether or not they'd had any other reports or anything of that nature. The Indian Reservation that happened on had been known for crime and drug usage, so some of the locals had actually referred to one street as Compton, after the Los Angeles neighborhood made famous by NWA. So at first, individuals in the community thought that this woman may have been murdered or something like that in a rather conventional manner. And indeed, she was so badly mutilated that they couldn't determine that the first responders were quoted in the radio traffic as not being sure if these were animal bites or knife bites or she'd been mauled by power tools. But it would appear from the DNA sampling being done and from the coroner's report that something with canine DNA and something resembling a dog was what tore this poor woman up. And it was from there, after I learned about this, that I learned about other missing people who'd been in that same area of Wyoming who've just vanished over the years under strange circumstances, as well as learning about other attacks of a similar nature that have occurred on Indian reservations that were then attributed to wild dogs and that saw a remarkable level of involvement of a number of federal agencies being involved in the investigation yet with a final release to the public saying only that we had this death and then blaming it on local dogs. But with the people in the areas offering contrary opinions as to just how dangerous or how numerous local dogs were. Right around the same time in 2014, there was another case 
in the Pine Ridge Reservation, and it was just a week later after this first attack that I spoke about, there was an eight-year-old girl who was out sledding, and she was set upon and killed, and the story came out that it was by a pack of wild dogs. And what I found interesting was that the police did something similar to what the coroner had done in this first case we discussed. They issued a be on the lookout to the residents saying, we've had an unknown animal attack, be on the lookout for an unknown predator, report anything unusual, any unusual sightings of a wild animal, anything of that nature. And the police chiefs actually quoted in the local paper saying they'd never seen anything of this magnitude. And even though they released the story that it was a dog attack, no one seemed sure of the breed or number of dogs. And again, we had a case where there were no witnesses, no one heard anything. In this case, the local Indian authorities, it was a different tribe, but in this case it was the Navajo, took the unusual step of hiring outside contractors to come in and capture and euthanize a number of the local dogs. Some of these dogs were, in fact, saved by a dog rescue outfit. They said that a lot of the dogs being rounded up seemed to just be people's pets that happened to be in the loose. There was almost like a case of the usual suspects round up what we thought was suspected. And the animal rescuers were actually trying to rescue some of these dogs. They made an interesting statement to the media saying that they believed it was not local dogs that were responsible for this attack, but packs of what they described as quote-unquote night dogs. And there was nothing further to illuminate that. But apparently locals at this reservation felt that in addition to the normal random run-of-the-mill stray dogs wandering around the buildings, that there was some other kind of predatory pack or group of dogs seen only at night that were only described as large and keeping fairly mysterious ways, and that these were the ones that were actually eating people or that had eaten this little girl. They actually had a horse trailer truck full of dogs that had been shot after this case from the contractors that went in and just started cleaning up the stray dogs. However, none of these were ever linked to the girl's death. We never heard anything from an autopsy on any of the dogs saying, oh, we found human remains in the stomach or blood on them or anything like that. It was simply a case of these dogs are in the area and we need to blame something and it needs to look like we're doing something, so let's go ahead and pretend that we're cleaning this up. That was another one of the things that led me to think that there was something strange going on was the fact that it seemed almost as though a uh, means to placate the local community and their question was offered up to try and find something that would seem plausible and get people to stop asking questions. And that led me to some other cases on Indian reservations. There was a, another reservation, the Rosebud Reservation. And this was about a, a year later, in the summer of 2015. There was a woman named Julia Charging Whirlwind who was found mauled to death. This was in White River, South Dakota, and it seemed to be the same situation, that we have a lack of witnesses, we have someone being found dead, we have federal agencies coming in, taking DNA tests, isolating the scene, and then we have local law enforcement saying that it's just a problem with stray dogs, we'll get it taken care of. And the later sheriff was later quoted as having shot and killed two dogs, that were never presented to anyone and never tied by a DNA or human remains or anything else to the death. It was all actually very vague. It seemed as though in some cases it's happening on an Indian reservation, it's not a site, it's not a mine. They just would prefer to stay that way, and especially because federal agencies are the ones that are handling these investigations for the most part, that there's a curtain of silence that then falls over the death beyond the initial media reporting attributing a strange death to being related to dog attacks. What kind of people are normally attacked in these instances? The pattern that I seem to have come across suggests that a predator is at work, a predator that selects victims and takes the elderly, the very young, or someone who is in some way impaired, either with a physical handicap, a mental handicap, or has caused themselves to be impaired by intoxication or drug use that in essence something is picking off the weaker members of the herd, especially when they're isolated or in the way of the predator while they're trying to get to something else. So 
such as domestic animals or domestic pets. In some of these death cases that we'll cover tonight, it seems as though the individuals who ended up being killed in an attack had themselves been around dogs, raising dogs, and were well familiar with them, and had, in the time period right before their tragic death, reported a strange number of missing pets or attacks on their livestock or pets. So it would seem as though there's also a predator that preys on the domestic animals of humans, and then if it's confronted in such a way that a human becomes a problem for it, is not afraid to attack, especially what appear to be weaker or isolated humans. It also has a habit of picking off people when they're alone, and early morning hours, I also discovered seem to be a time, it seems that dawn and dusk seem to be key times where a lot of these things seem to happen. You have attacks in the early morning, and you have attacks around the time of sunset. So that would suggest a predator that works at night and that shuns broad daylight, I would say, that almost as though there's an intelligence behind the attacks that whatever takes these people tries to avoid witnesses and tries to avoid being seen. As we'll discuss in some of the attacks, whenever there has been a witness, they've only made vague reports along the lines of seeing strange dogs or large dogs or large-headed dogs. And what I think is going on is that even when people see something that they don't know how to process what it is they've just seen, no one wants to seem like a crazy person, so they just try and frame it in a format that's familiar to them. In these cases, we should look at, well, is there a pattern emerging? Is this something that keeps going on? And does it seem like there's efforts to investigate it that aren't being made public? And that's what got me started down the rabbit hole. When you hear about how brutally some of these people were attacked and killed, it sure makes you wonder how these attacks played out. Moving on, though, I understand one case that you've researched really stands out in your mind as being extraordinary. I'm talking about the case with Natalie Adams. What happened to her? She was an 81-year-old woman who lived in Georgia. It was a somewhat rural area surrounding woods and such, but by no means was it the middle of nowhere, and by no means was there no one around. She did have neighbors nearby, and this woman was fairly spry for her age. She had a habit of going out in the morning to collect cans for recycling. I'm not sure if she was doing that for the money or if she just liked the environment, but every morning she had a habit of going out and picking up cans. And then one morning, unfortunately, something got to her while she was out picking up these cans. She was found very badly mauled. And in this case, there was a law enforcement response, but beyond the first responders, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, rather than the federal government, was involved. It was known that they took DNA samples, they cordoned off the scene and seemed to be paying a great deal of attention to this, much more so than if anyone had been hit by a car or some other kind of an accidental death. Natalie Adams was found in the ditch at 8.32 on a Tuesday morning. So, again, we're with an early morning attack. There were no witnesses. No one saw anything. The body was very badly mutilated. We know that DNA swabs were taken, and we know that what autopsy results were released said that they believed it was caused by a dog attack and that the injuries were horrific. But beyond that, no dogs were ever caught. No one was ever charged. We have weasel words by the authorities saying autopsy results were consistent with a dog attack, but not saying it was a dog attack. In this case, the authorities put out baited traps and worked with animal control to blame the usual suspects and try and round up a few dogs. Yet no one ever caught an animal that found human remains in its stomach. No one saw any dogs with blood on them. No one saw anything of that nature. We just had a woman who was going out on her daily routine, suspected nothing, and bam, something got to her. The authorities themselves, the GBI, described it as a very unusual death, to say the least. And here we have a woman who's in good shape. This shouldn't have happened to her. If the media reports say she's killed by a dog attack, yet if a number of dogs had set upon her, 
why did no one hear anything? Why did no one see anything? Why weren't dogs seen in the area? No sound of barking, no noise, nothing. Just an attack seemingly out of nowhere. And now we have a dead woman who was described as being shredded, being found in the ditch right off of the road she lives on, barely, I believe, it was like a half mile from her own home. And then we have a lack of follow-up from law enforcement. We know the Georgia Bureau of Investigation was there, not just the county sheriff, but state law enforcement officials. And there was also rumors that the FBI was present. So if we have just something simple like a dog attack, why do we have state and federal authorities involved in taking DNA exams? Why wouldn't it be a matter just for the county sheriff? And why does no one see anything? There was evidence of a struggle found nearby. We had broken yard furniture, blood everywhere. And again, something that was to show up in many of these cases is that clothing was torn off of the victim, that the victim was found missing most of her clothes, which seems like whatever predator this is likes to rip through or rip off clothes. And that tied me back to what I'd read before in some of the missing 411 cases in David Police's excellent series of books that unfortunately raised more questions than it could provide any answers, that a number of times when people were found missing under mysterious circumstances and a body is later found, that they were strangely either partially or fully unclothed or missing items of clothing. That poor woman, I can't even imagine what she must have gone through. Yes, it's, it's a tragedy, especially considering that she was just going through her normal daily routine, and then apparently a predator may have been stalking her or may have been stalking the area or even laying in wait for her. Yeah, it doesn't get much more tragic than that. How about the Reverend John Reynolds case? This is another interesting case where the usual suspects seem to be blamed. Reverend John Reynolds was a man who was very well familiar with dogs. He, in fact, ran a dog rescue. He'd been known to rescue pit bulls, foster them. He certainly knew his way around large animals. And yet he was discovered dead, very badly mutilated, in his animal enclosure. Now, you would think, well, and this is, I believe, what the media reports wanted people to think initially was you think, oh, well, that's too bad, but his dogs must have got to him. The problem with that is his son, who had the same name, reported to the media that in the days leading up to this, they'd had trouble with something trying to, an unknown creature trying to get in through their fence to the domestic dogs that the Reverend was actually fostering and raising. And they actually had, at the time they found his body, they found his pit bull, his favorite dog, dead, very badly mutilated. I mean, we're talking about a large animal. We're talking about an adult male pit bull had been mutilated and was also dead nearby. And then two additional female pit bulls were found in a state of what they described as being like shock. They were found hiding nearby as though something had greatly spooked them. The Reverend's son suggested that these reports that it was his dogs that did it were foolish because here's the dog's in the enclosure and you have one dead and you have two badly traumatized. They don't have human blood on them. They obviously haven't been eating them. And something had been trying to get into this enclosure to get to these dogs, almost like something was viewing them as prey in the days leading up to this. The Reverend's son suggested that a mountain lion was to blame because something, whatever it was that got in there, was able to penetrate fences that kept multiple pit bulls from wandering out and then was able to kill one adult pit bull that apparently decided to defend its owner and caused two others to run and basically hide and flee for their lives and not come back out until the crime scene was being secured. So it certainly didn't seem to me like a case of an individual being killed by their dogs. It seemed as though something was preying on the dogs, using them as a prey animal. And then unfortunately the Reverend Reynolds got in its way or tried to stop it or was just in the wrong place at the wrong time and also fell a victim to it. It seems that when these cases happen, that even local law enforcement is shocked at the level of severity and the level of damage done to these bodies, that there's been reports of people looking like they're victims of power tools or shark attacks or things of that nature, that the words seem to almost fail the first responders in terms of trying to describe the carnage that they encounter. We know in some cases that body parts have been literally strewn about the area. I'm sure that media reports get sanitized to a certain extent, 
but I've run across descriptions saying things like arms and legs were basically strewn about the area. You're talking about scenes of intense carnage, that just people torn apart, organs missing, limbs torn off, just terrible mutilation to the point where sometimes there's even an issue with identifying the body. One of the classic cases I ran across was back in the 1960s, where we had a woman who was reported as being killed by her own dog. She was in the habit of raising show Doberman, and eventually her dog was blamed, and her dog was shot by the local sheriff. However, the problem is that here, as in the Reynolds case, the actual dog that was eventually blamed was found in hiding when the sheriff got there. The dog was basically cowering in fear and did not seem at all aggressive. This case was interesting, and it's hard to find exact details since I was relying on older newspaper accounts, but it was known that the woman's house was essentially devastated. She was in her 60s. She lived alone, but was known to be in good health, and her house was devastated. We had signs of a struggle. It looked like there'd been, according to some witnesses, a war inside of her living room. We had smashed furniture. We had lamps pulled over. We had evidence of an extreme struggle. We had broken glass. We had dishes thrown about. It looks like she literally had fought for her life. And what's interesting about that is also, even though her dog was eventually blamed and shot, no one mentioned finding her dog being wounded or torn up or in any way bloodied or harmed. So it would suggest that something got into this woman's house and attacked her, And it looked as though, from the way the struggle was laid out, that she would either had been attacked at her own front door or was trying to get to the front door and get out. The newspaper accounts weren't specific as to which scenario was the case. But, obviously, this woman had the son of dogs by her house. It was a place that was known to have dogs. And here we have somewhere even in her own house. Keep in mind, this is in the woods she was found dead. This isn't someone disappearing on a lonely hunting trip. This is someone in their own home that is actually found with their home torn apart, their furnishings torn apart, and themselves torn apart and badly mutilated. And their pet, in this case a large Doberman, is essentially hiding, frightened out of its mind, and ends up getting the blame for it simply because no one seemed to have been quite sure what to make of it. It obviously wasn't a person, and her wounds did resemble those of a canine attack, albeit much more severe and much more devastating. You told me in the pre-interview that the first responders described the crime scene as looking as if a monster had been set loose in her house. Yes, I believe that is what the local sheriff was quoted as saying, that it looked like a monster had gotten in there. I believe they also described it as looking like a war zone. And since this was the 1960s, You're talking about individuals and local law enforcement who would have been World War II veterans who certainly had seen real war zones, had seen real carnage, and had no other words to describe what they were seeing. It obviously did not seem to be a human predator because that's why they used the term monster. And what's conjured to my mind was, of course, the classic Hollywood fair of the beast gets in the house and there's a battle, and in this case, someone didn't get away or wasn't able to fight it off. That does paint a pretty ominous picture. Please tell us about the Daryl Roberson case. Daryl Roberson was an interesting case. This happened in the Internet age, so we can actually find some information about it online without having to dig through dead newspaper journals. What we have here is we have an individual who's 42 years old. It's not known to me if he had any kind of impairment, but he was found in the early morning by his local paper carrier doing the route. He was found dead. In this case, we actually did have witnesses in that the paper carrier reported two unknown large dogs were chewing on him, on his body. These dogs were never found. Police were quoted as saying they were relatively sure that they were Roddy's or Doberman's because the report said that they were basically large black dogs. A neighbor had described Daryl as a big guy, that they weren't sure how this could have happened to him. Police estimated that the attack took place in the very early morning hours, either at dawn or just before. And this was another of the cases where we had local police giving a be on the lookout warning to the local neighborhood, and that they actually said to people in this general area, they said, be careful about letting your children out. We have an unknown dog or dogs on the loose. We're not sure where they are. We're not sure who they belong to, but you need to keep your children in for right now and we'll just take care of this. 
So you had an individual who's going about their daily business, and something, again, sets on them, just attacks them out of nowhere. This is one of the few cases where it seems to have been a healthy adult male who should have even been able to put up a fight, and even he was not safe, that he was just torn to bits. So I don't know if he got in the way of something, if something took him as a prey of opportunity, or what had happened, but here we have someone prowling the early morning hours, they're out by their own home, and they're set upon. Um, There was some suggestion that Daryl, too, had been out searching for either recycling or cans, that he was prone to do this in the early morning hours. I guess that's when the pickings were good, and that's when he was set upon. And so it seems to me that individuals who are out in the early morning hours, they should be aware that North America is not a tame place as we would like to believe. There are still things out there that do take people, that attack people, that eat people, that maul people, and that strike at certain times of the day, that many people should just keep an eye out over their shoulder. I mean, if nothing else, if no, if someone doesn't believe in Dog Man or Bigfoot or any cryptid whatsoever, what I would like them to take away from all this is that people are, in fact, in late 20th, early 21st century America, being taken by predators being killed in their own neighborhoods, being horrifically torn apart, mutilated, and devoured, and that there's something out there. If you say, oh, dog man, that's that's crap, that's nothing, there's no such thing as Bigfoot. Okay, I'm fine with that. Let's say the authorities are telling the truth, and that there are all these random packs of unknown large dogs wandering America. I still want people to just think to themselves, wait, why does this keep happening? And maybe I should keep an eye on my kids. Maybe I should keep an eye on grandma. Maybe I should keep an eye on myself when I'm out, especially at these times of the day or by myself. If I could add one more thing about the Daryl Robertson case, it would be that very much this was not in the woods. It actually took place in the suburbs of Tulsa, Oklahoma. So you have not a remote wilderness area, not some frontier wilderness like people imagine exists in Alaska or Canada or here in Wyoming, but you have the suburbs of a major American city, and we still see these attacks taking place. One of the disturbing cases I ran across was an older case. It was from May of 1959. There was what was really a toddler. His name was Mark Draper. He was killed by what was described as a pack of seven to ten large dogs. Now, what made this case interesting, and again, it was a case where I only found older newspaper accounts, was that a posse was actually formed to hunt down all the nearby dogs. About 100 to 150 people took to the woods with their rifles and shotguns. This was at the height of the Cold War. So what happened is the local civil defense wardens, the people who would have been responsible for shuffling people in the shelters and maintaining order in the case of a Soviet missile attack, actually went around and the local block wardens organized everyone, got everyone who could hold a rifle or a shotgun out, and combed the woods and shot all the usual suspect dogs they could. At least 15 dogs were killed and three were captured. What we know is very little beyond that, and that witnesses described only that there was a large black dog or several of them that was seen. It was suggested that the police and civil defense were out there, and it specifically mentioned in the newspapers at the time, riot guns, which were shorter-barreled, high-capacity 12-gauge shotguns, were out searching the woods. But with this boy, again, his clothes were torn off and ripped to shreds. The boy was missing. He'd been out playing. The mother had just gone inside for a few minutes to do something, thinking nothing of it, thinking her son, well, he'll be safe. This is late 1950s America. Crime, animal attacks, like that certainly is not anyone's mind. This is the era of the Lone Ranger. This is Howdy Doody. This is a relatively peaceful time, especially in suburban America. So she goes inside, then comes back out, can't find her son. So she asks one of the neighbors, go and look for him. She's one of the neighbors out working in his yard. He goes out, he actually is the one who's described seeing a large black dog chewing on the boy. He armed himself with it was described as a club, and I'm not sure if this was something he fought with him, or more likely it was something like a large stick or branch on the ground, and approached this one large dog he saw, and actually appears to have made physical contact with it, beating it to get it off the boy's body. It wasn't entirely clear from the older newspaper reports if this is a case of 
this was one of the animals that was attacked. One of the newspaper reports described this as a pack leader, suggesting that there were other animals waiting just out of eyesight in the woods, but that the gentleman only happened to see this one or challenge this one animal. No specific breed was mentioned. It was mentioned only that we have a large, dark-colored dog. And here you have a little boy who, basically in the safety of his own yard, goes missing because something snatched it. The fact that the animal or animals broke off the assault when confronted by an armed adult male would suggest to me that Mark Draper, who was a little more than a toddler, was taken as a victim of opportunity precisely because he was weak. And that for whatever reason, here again, we have the case of the clothes are missing, torn off, strewn about. And that seems like an awful lot of dexterity for a normal dog. I've had in my life dogs come up to me and try and bite me. And I've actually seen other dogs try and bite people. And usually dogs don't try and undress their victims. They don't have opposable thumbs. They don't really have the ability to do that. They just kind of latch in and bite or claw at. They're not specifically being concerned with stripping their victims. And I'm not sure why this is going on. I'm not sure why that's important to them. Maybe clothes taste bad. I honestly don't know. But it certainly is something that's happening in these cases. Back in the late 1950s, people would try and handle things on their own of this nature. I don't know that the federal government would have been something that would even occur to them to go to. They probably legitimately did think it was large dogs, I believe, in this case. And that's why they decided to do a bit of girl American self-help. And the local civil defense people took it on themselves to start handing out rifles or shotguns and round up everybody with a gun and take to the woods because they certainly thought it was something strange going on and they wanted to take care of the situation. And this was near Hazelwood, Missouri, that this happened. So you'll find information about it. And if someone's in the area, they can probably find out even more about it than I was able to from possibly the St. Louis papers. A lot of the news reports were Dayline St. Louis on the Mark Draper case. And it's something I'd like to find out more about myself, because here we have what seemed to be an organized response. And I'll admit that there's a possibility that perhaps there was a federal organized response here, too, because it was the local civil defense apparatus, the people in charge of responding to an enemy attack on the domestic heartland. There was no homeland security back then. It fell under the umbrella of the civil defense agency, were specifically mentioned as being involved and that the local police were breaking up their riot equipment. So it would seem to be something much more seriously going on than anyone concerned about a single stray dog. A single stray dog, even in the horrific case that it was killing a small child, you would not think that that would require uh, posses of over 100 armed men to comb through the woods to look for a single dog. It simply is mind-boggling that, I guess at the time, this is pre-Watergate, pre-Vietnam War, People weren't as likely to question things, and they were settled for an explanation. And obviously, with a hundred or more men prowling the woods, the local media report had to say something happened. So they simply said they were looking for a pack of large dogs. Yet, we know there was at least one large dog. We don't know anything about a breed. All we know is that's being officially reported is large dog, unknown type. And here you have a mass of almost militarized response to it. Can we backtrack just for a second? Sure. The woman who was torn apart by the dog in her own home, that was Frances Tetterault. I actually just found the page. The one that raised the show, Dobermans. It would happen in New Jersey. Something happened in Lynchburg, Virginia in the late 1960s. It was in 1967, around December 17th. And the month of December would become important because the November-December time frame seemed to be to me when a lot of these attacks were being reported, and I still don't know how significant that is. This is another case where we have two young children. They're out playing. You have Eugene Goodman and his brother, Kenneth, four years old and three years old, out playing in their yard. Mother sends them out playing. Dad's doing his yard work. Now, what's interesting is that before this happened, there had been reports that pets had been being killed in the area and turning up missing. So there was some suggestion that maybe something strange is going on, but certainly not enough that people were thinking about it to keep their kids indoors. So the boys are out playing. In this case, the mother actually did hear something. She never heard the sounds of animals, but she did hear the sounds of her children screaming. She immediately runs outside, says to their dad, Oh, my God, where are our kids? What's going on? 
The dad still has his break in his hand. He runs out there, and he finds his children out there by a nearby creek, just beyond their backyard, being torn apart. He set upon what he described as large, dark dogs that were doing the attacking, armed with nothing but his rake, and again, was able to drive them off. Because here again, we have two small children, barely more than toddlers, set upon as a target of opportunity. Since there were two of them, I believe that's why one of them was able to scream loud enough that their mom heard it. In a lot of these cases, we have no witnesses, no one sees anything. I think that because there were two, that one of them was able to get these screams out that their mom heard. And I think it was also because their dad was nearby and was armed to some extent, even with just a rake, that whatever set upon these boys, whether it was one animal or a group or whether it was just dogs or whether we're talking dog man, they immediately backed off when confronted with an armed and fit adult man. And these creatures were described as being like large, dark dogs again. What my theory is, and I can't prove it, but what my theory is is that some of these cases we're seeing attacks by, for lack of a better term, a juvenile dog man. A creature or creatures not yet totally experienced but that are unwilling to take on an adult human or intelligent enough not to stick around on the scene once an adult human, particularly an armed male, sets upon the scene. As we'll discuss later with some other cases, I don't believe that being an armed, healthy male is necessarily going to protect you, but I believe that in some of these cases where you're seeing the young, basically children, picked off, that once resistance is offered, that it'll end the attack or end the incident. And I think that's important to realize because it would mean that people aren't entirely helpless, that there are things that could be done simply by being aware and prepared. Yeah, I'll bet you're right on the money with that. I know of several instances where armed men were firing at dogmen with pretty potent weaponry and the dogmen still advanced on them. So what you said about the whole juvenile thing there... You're probably right. Moving on, let's talk about the Kevin Zook case from 1980. Kevin Zook is another one of these cases that, as soon as you read about it, you're struck by this almost seems like a scene from a horror movie. Here we had young Kevin. He was a teenager, so I, I don't know if we should call him young. He was 14 years old at the time. He'd been out riding his motorbike, and we're talking about rural Illinois. So we're not talking about the great wilds of Alaska or something like that. We're talking about Midwestern American farm country. The boy's out riding his motorbike, which was his hobby. It's 1980 America. It's a fairly safe place. You're in a rural area. No one's expecting anything to happen. Everyone believes that all the large predators have gone away long ago and that no one believes the crime to be a real issue, certainly. So Kevin's out riding his motorbike. And he runs out of gas. Now, they know this because they later found the motorbike out of gas. Uh, he parks it nearby, and he goes over to a nearby farmhouse, and he knocks on the door. And unfortunately, no one's home when he knocks on the door. If there was, this whole thing could have turned out probably much differently. So the story picks up when someone does return home, and what they find is just a horrific scene. They found an actual trail marred by unknown paw prints, bloody footprints, and bits of human flesh and clothing where it appeared that something had attacked Kevin right near this door, caused him to flee into a nearby cornfield, running for his life and leaving a trail of blood and carnage in his way. And there he's found dead. He was missing about 24 hours by the time he was found. So he'd been pretty badly torn up, and they found him in the cornfield. So we have paw prints. We have bloody footprints. And here's another case where he was found nearly naked. About all he had on was on one foot he had a shoe, and on the other foot, he had a sock. He had over 100 bites. There were bloody paw prints found in the mud. And we have this boy who's just set upon, on a mundane day, something appears to have been prowling this farm, perhaps looking for domestic animals, perhaps marking his territory, perhaps scouting. I'm not an animal psychologist. I don't know. And sets upon poor Kevin. He runs for it. He runs for his life. He runs through the field. He tries to get away tries to hide whatever he's trying to do. But here you have a healthy young man. He's 14 years old. He was an outdoorsman. He's gone out on his dirt bike. He's been going around. You'd think he'd be able to put up a fight, yet whatever thing or things got him, 
was able to run him down and tear him to bits, basically out in someone's farmyard. It's just a tragic case. But again, we have the victim stripped naked, paw prints, dog-like injuries. Local dogs, again, got the blame in the media reports, saying, well, he must have been set upon by some local farm dogs. But at least unanswered the question of, well, where are these vicious farm dogs? Who did they belong to? Why wasn't someone charged? Why weren't the dogs found? It's just mind-boggling that you could say, oh, well, it must have been dogs. Well, this doesn't sound like just a case of some farm dogs, because no one else had been torn apart. The people who lived on this farm weren't torn apart. But you have this boy who's out just enjoying himself for the evening, and his life comes to an end because something Something strange happened. He's set upon, he's stripped of his clothes, he's run down like a game animal, he's chased down, and he's just torn to bits and partially devoured. There is an author named Jan Thompson who related a story that was really similar to the one that you just talked about. I don't know as a fact that her story is true, but the story has this kid riding his dirt bike through the woods. A dog man jumped out and grabbed his leg. He gunned the bike and took off. He was able to race back through the woods, get out of the woods, and ditch the bike in front of his house and race inside to safety. As you were telling me about this story, I was thinking about all the similarities and everything. As I've been listening to these stories that you've been sharing, I've been trying to put my finger on which one is the most disturbing. The next case that I'm going to ask you to talk about involving Angie Nickerson in March of 89, that would have to rank close to the top. Please tell us about that. Angie was just a kindergartner. She was just over five years old, and she was actually torn apart after getting off her own school bus. And that's one of the things that really bothered me. She got off the school bus around 11, 30 or so, and she was found dead two hours later by the mail carrier. The news reports stated that she was, quote, chewed to the bone, and it resembled a shark attack. There were no witnesses, despite the fact that this is 11.30 in the morning. It's in a part of Michigan that's rural, but by no means desolate. You have an area that's presumed to be safe because they're not going to let you off the school bus. I've got children that age myself. They usually let you off the school bus essentially right in front of your house or within sight of your house. So you have this little girl torn to ribbons within sight of her house, almost unidentifiable. Her clothes were torn to bits. No witnesses actually saw the attack. When the mail carrier found the body, they did see two neighborhood dogs sniffing around her clothes that were still there when state police arrived. So essentially, they just say, oh, well, it must have been neighborhood dogs that did it. However, these dogs, they were pretty much just investigating the strange scents and the carnage at the scene. They weren't found blooded. They weren't found with human remains in their stomach. And these were pet dogs. These were dogs that people kept. They'd certainly never eaten their owners. They'd never tried to eat a child before. And you have just this little girl. She should be safe. She goes to school. She's had a nice day at kindergarten. She's getting off. She's coming home. And then, bam, right there, within sight of her house, something, some predator had to have set upon her. And it had to have worked fast. And it had to have worked quietly. It had to have taken her such that her screams couldn't have been heard by any neighbors and that no one saw anything, that no one remarked on anything. It was, bam, it was ambush predation. One of the strange things that struck out to me, I don't know if this means anything or not, but the number of attacks seemed to happen around Christmas time. When I was a boy, I had a book about werewolf stories. I'd gotten it through Scholastic Books or something like that. And it had the notation that that werewolves were said to be active around Christmas time. I'm not saying that that's what's going on here, but I just found it strange that some of these things seem to happen around that very time. So maybe the old folklore may have had a bit of truth to it. Certainly it did on Christmas Day, April 1997, when young April Edwards, she was only five years old, suffering from a cognitive disability. She was playing near her grandfather's trailer. She was described as suffering from a cognitive disability. I'm not sure exactly what that entailed. Obviously, she was in some way slightly impaired. She's playing out in the yard. It's Christmas Day. No one's going to suspect anything's going to go wrong. And suddenly, they go out to look for her, except she's not there. Eventually, the search did turn up. Her body, again found dead, horribly mutilated. Neighborhood dogs, again, get the blame. Because, well, what else is it going to be, is likely what a lot of people were thinking. What else could be in this area 
that would take someone out of their own yard. There's no bears in this area. There's no mountain lions, no wolves. We have what looks like dog bites. But, again, we have no witnesses. No one heard her scream. Something seems to have grabbed her out of her own yard, taken her, and assaulted her, and just torn her to bits, all in the space of what must have been a very brief time. Because you had her grandfather actually indoors, and he was reported saying that he didn't have his eyes off her for more than 20 or 30 minutes. You have something capable of striking within a matter of a very brief time frame, making off with a child, taking them to a nearby area, and badly mutilating the body. That struck me as having a level of subtlety, a level of planning, and a level of intelligence to it that did not sound like the work of a pack of neighborhood dogs or random dogs that would think to be laying in wait to take someone. It's almost as though it was deliberate predation on members of the human species. Yeah, these cases are just so hard to describe. It seems like they raise more questions than answers. I have only a pattern that certainly strikes me as alarming. I can't say, this is this, this is that. In a way, it's similar to the missing 411 cases, where I think David Politis did an excellent job of establishing that there's cases where people go missing in the woods when they shouldn't. I'd like to establish and get people to realize that there's cases where people are vanishing or being mauled, mutilated, killed, eaten in modern America. It's being blamed on dogs, but there's questions that would suggest that maybe this isn't your normal run-of-the-mill dogs, or certainly not your average household pet that's responsible. I hate the fact that that's happening, and unfortunately, dogs that aren't responsible for these deaths were killed. In 2001, Rodney McAllister was found dead. Please tell us about that case. This is yet another case where you have a younger individual. He was only 10 years old. This happened near St. Louis, Missouri. The boy was found dead in the park. Again, his clothes was torn off, and the newspaper report described him as being, quote, literally eaten, unquote. Neighbors, when the police canvassed the area, said they heard sound of what well, they reported to be suffering, and they never nailed down what suffering entailed. The report only said suffering. Two hours after the boy went to play in the park, what essentially happened is his mom sent him to play in the park. She was at home, figured he was 10, didn't think anything of it. No witnesses actually saw this attack. Local random strays were blamed. In this case, to add to the mother's tragedy of losing her son, she was actually faced charges related to poor parenting for letting her son go out to play in the park without keeping a watch on him. I was not able to determine in my initial research at this point whether she was actually convicted or not, but she lets her son go play in the park. It's a park. There's jungle gyms. There's play sets. You know, normally there'd probably be people around. For whatever reason, there wasn't, or he was at the edge of the park. I still haven't nailed down why it was that he was taken. But certainly there were neighbors within earshot, because in hindsight, they've heard something strange, something they described as suffering. And here you have a 10-year-old kid near St. Louis. He goes out to play, and he's eaten. Something took this boy, and to quote the media, which was putting the authorities, literally eaten. This is 2001 Missouri. This is the wilds of India. This isn't, again, the wilds of Alaska. You have, again, clothes gone, child taken in a short period of time, no witnesses, no sound, nothing, and dogs end up being blamed, which I suspect is because, again, in these cases, you're having canine DNA is what's turning up, as well as wounds very much like dog bites or, in the words of some of these corners, consistent with dog attacks but much more severe, much more horrific, taken more to a shark attack. In the cases of seasoned law enforcement professionals, like nothing they've seen before or warranting a be on the lookout for the area or to call an armed posse, that there's something very strange going on. For them to describe the crime scene as looking as if a shark attack had taken place, that says it all right there. In 2005, Lydia Elaine Chapel was found suffering from hypothermia and was unconscious. Please tell us about what happened there. Here we have someone younger. This is again in rural Illinois, the same as Kevin Zook. 
suggesting that, again, we hear about the classical Michigan dog case or the Beast of Bray Road or these reports from the Michigan, Wisconsin, Illinois area. That's one of the reasons this stuck out in my in my mind. Lydia had snuck out, perhaps to see her boyfriend, perhaps for some other reasons, early in the morning. Her parents, as soon as they noticed her missing, it was about 6.30 in the morning. So, again, you have these early morning hours. They found her not in her bed. They saw she snuck out to go see her boyfriend or something. She was found in the ditch at 7.30 in the morning. Now, they officially chalked this one up as death due to hypothermia. Now, it seems odd to me that someone who's healthy in Illinois, even in the winter, would have frozen to death within an hour. But what's interesting is that when she was found, they initially thought she had been hit by a large car moving very fast because she was just that badly torn up. She's laying in the ditch. She's torn up, ripped up, just very badly bloody. She was still alive when they found her, but was never able to make a statement. And then she's only been out there for at most an hour, and yet in this case they didn't even go with the usual report of dog attacks. They said, well, it was hypothermia that killed her, and she just happened to have also been attacked by one or more large dogs. In this case, it just struck me as mind-boggling that it could happen this quick. Now, what I found myself wondering when she was missing from her bed, I found myself with the creepy thought, what if something actually took her from her bed or took her from her house or otherwise lured her out of that house and got to it? Because there was never any definitive proof as to why she left or why she was missing. All her parents knew was that she'd gone to bed that night. They knew she was in bed. They go to look for her that morning to get her up to go to school or get up in the morning or whatever, and suddenly she's not in her bed. She's missing. They do the responsible thing. They contact the police. They put a search out. Oh, be on the lookout for our daughter. She's not in her bed. She's gone. She's missing. We don't know why she's gone. We don't know what happened to her. And within an hour, within one hour, she's found dying, mutilated, laying in a ditch. And it struck me as being very strange that this happened. And I honestly wondered, did something, in fact, have the intelligence? So we know that there's been people killed in their own home. We know that the dog's been blamed. So I found myself wondering, did something even possibly take her out of her own bed or lure her out of her own bed that morning? And I don't think we'll ever know. All we'll know is that something got to her. They initially thought it was a car, and then they report, no, it's dog bites. It's canine DNA. It's, it's a just a scene of terrible mutilation again, and it all happened very fast. And it seemed like one of those cases where even being in your own yard or even your own home isn't necessarily a guarantee of safety. We know something killed her. Again, if people want to say, oh, it wasn't Bigfoot, it wasn't Dog Man, it wasn't any of this. Okay, so what was it? There was certainly something out there that was dangerous. Something that set upon this teen girl in today's America, not so long ago at all, and was able to do damage to her in a very short period of time that made it resemble someone being hit by a car, which suggests a weighty animal, a large animal, a very vicious attacker was able to get to her and cause sufficient loss of blood that I believe the loss of blood was actually probably the real cause of death, but that the loss of blood tied in with the hypothermia. But she certainly wasn't out there for long, no more than an hour. So it's just, it, 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 it bothers me. This is another one of those cases that just kind of bothered me, that someone's gone from their own bed. That it seems almost like there's no safe place. That's one of the things that kind of keeps me up at night, thinking that, be you in the suburbs, be you in the woods, be you even in a large city, that there's people being taken, people being horribly killed, even out of their own home, their own yards, that there really is not a safe place. This is something that just sticks in the back of your mind as being alarming. And that's putting it mildly. Oh, I'd say it's more than alarming. It's one thing to think that you're only at risk when you go outside, but to think for a second that you might not be safe laying in your own bed, in your own home, that takes it to a new level. Well, it's about time to wrap this show up, Christopher. We have so much material that we didn't get to cover tonight. Would you be open to coming back next week and doing another show so that we can cover all these cases? Sure, I'd be happy to do that. I just want to get this information out there so people will be aware. Well, it's definitely appreciated. I think it's important people know about this. Well, thanks so much for coming on and sharing the details of all these cases with us. I really do appreciate you sharing your time with us. 
good timing. My kids just escaped, so. <laughs> Thanks again so much for your time, Christopher. No problem. I'm glad to offer it. Thanks again for coming in. Have a great night. Thank you. We'll see you.